Good morning. What a great day to have you with us today. We want to welcome you from wherever you are, whether you're from Ontario, Canada, or the world, you are in for a treat today because the message is just going to be one of those days where the message really uh, resonates with our heart, soul, and mind. It's again, Jesus. It's all about him. And so we want to celebrate him. And I uh, hope you are because the time is short. And as we see these things happening, I hope that you know him by faith and as you walk with him. I hope you're engaging in a wonderful church. And if you're not, you can always participate here at Cedardale Church on Sunday. We want to also uh, let you know that we're having VBS on the uh, 12th, 13th, and 14th of August. And so if you have little ones or grandchildren or whatever, you are welcome to bring them here for those three days of fun and crafts and all kinds of wonderful Bible stories so that they will learn about Jesus. Amen? And so if you're a wonderful grandparent that has doing grandma duty like uh, grandpa and grandma duty like my wife and I are, uh, then uh, bring those little feet here because we will love to have them. And there's snacks, believe it or not. There's snacks, so they'll enjoy the whole experience. Well, welcome. And uh, as I said, this is a wonderful day. Uh, as we look at the topic and the text that we have today. So uh, before I introduce that, I'm going to um, share with you the scripture. And our reading today is from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10. My key verse for this whole message is Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. Friends, that mission hasn't changed over 2,000 years, and he is still... Uh, with that heartbeat of reaching the lost. So I hope you tune in and stay with us as we look at this vital message for today. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and that's important to know, and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of his uh, short stature and the crowd, he could not because he was small you see, small in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that very way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled, for he had gone to be a guest of a man who was a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to your house. And since he is also the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I want to turn your attention also to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 to 16. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, an insolent opponent, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord flowed for me and with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Friends, aren't you glad that you have eternal life? I hope you have it. I hope that you know that you have it, and you can. You just need to come to Jesus Christ, and he is the only one in the world that can give that to you. Muhammad can't give that to you. Buddha can't give that to you. Enlightenment practices cannot give you eternal life. It's only through the person and work of Jesus Christ, our Lord. My topic today is simply called Pursuing the Lost, the Heartbeat of Jesus' Mission. Jesus has always been a seeking savior, and he's always had a mission, a grand mission at that, from the time he stepped into the world until he left, dying on a cross, 
He's always been about seeking and saving those who are lost. Matthew 1, 21 will declare right from the early moments of Scripture in the New Testament. And she will bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, for he will save his people from their what? Sins. He, Jesus did not come to be a therapist. He did not come to be anything like that. He came as a savior. For it says in Isaiah chapter 63 that he is mighty to save. And friends, that hasn't changed either. In Matthew 15, Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Isn't that a fascinating statement? The sheep that he was referring to were the people of his day in Israel. And with all the laws and with all those conscriptions and all those things that the scribes and Pharisees had built up since the time in Babylon, there was suffocating stuff going on for them to perform and continue on in, but they were never really free from the shackles of the law and laws that they were put on. Jesus came to seek and to save. Isn't that wonderful? And Jesus would say in Luke chapter 5, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So in Luke 19, ends on a very miraculous note. For I have come to seek and to save that which is lost. It's a very powerful statement. In fact, if you study that phrase throughout the whole entirety of the New Testament, it's very powerful. And it's very enlightening. And it's very, very thrilling to know that these words came from Jesus' own lips. In the heart of Jericho, amidst the bustling crowd and the towering sycamore tree, a divine encounter unfolds. Zacchaeus, a man scorned and ostracized for his profession, seeks a glimpse of Jesus. Little does he know that this moment will forever alter the trajectory of his life. Luke 19.10 paints a vivid, vivid portrait of transformation, of a lost soul found and, and the heart open to the radical grace of God. Friends, it's not just grace, it's radical, wonderful grace. I hope you know it. Verse 10, the resounding heartbeat of this narrative proclaims, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. This declaration brimming with power and urgency, friends, is full of urgency, encapsulates the very essence of Jesus' mission. A mission fueled, listen, by relentless love, unwavering compassion, and unyielding determination to rescue humanity from the clutches of despair and hopelessness. The mission is, my friends, not confined just to the pages of Scripture. It is a living, breathing mandate that extends to every one of us. We too are called to be conduits of hope, to embody the radical love of God. I hope you're radical with the love of God, not protesting on the streets like so many are in this world, with a heart that's radically been changed because of God's grace, to share that glorious gospel with a world yearning for liberation. Look, the world is yearning for liberation right now. They don't even understand it, but that's what's happening. It is a mission that compels each one of us to step outside our, our comfort zones. As I say, get out of your silo. Just get out of your silo. Don't stay in it. Get out there. Join a chamber of commerce or do something. Be part of a bowling league. Get out there in the community and engage with those that are lost. To engage those who are lost and broken to offer them the life-transforming message of salvation. Because Jesus, you see, is always mighty to save. In the following moments, we will delve deeper into this wonderful mission of Jesus, exploring how we can actively participate in God's redemptive plan and witness, yes, witness the extraordinary power of the gospel to break chains and heal wounds and restore hope for the hopeless. What made the difference in Zacchaeus' life? I want to ask you that today. Jesus, what made the difference in my life? Jesus, and what made the difference? And what can make the difference in your life? And friends, I'm going to tell you, it's Jesus. 
If you say anything else but that, you're already on the wrong track because it's Jesus and Jesus only. For he is always a savior on an errand of mercy. This story, of course, is recorded in the Gospel of Luke. It's a fascinating story. It's not a tale and it's not a fairy tale. It's about a real man with a real life who had a real profession of collecting taxes. And he was hated. That's probably an understatement to say that he was hated. God is a seeker of the lost. That's something that we should never forget. Despite the programs and the things that go on in a church across Canada or the world, we should never forget in the DNA of our soul that Jesus is a seeker of the lost and the church is a wonderful place to share that mission, to share that wonderful opportunity to those that are lost that they should be able to come in and have a coffee and find the truth that will set them free. Even at the beginning of creation, when we fell into horrible sin, God, you see, is a seeker of the lost. For his first question to Adam is, where are you? I'm going to ask you that question. Maybe God is asking you that today. Where are you, Bill or Ron or whoever your name might be? Where are you? Now, God knows where you are. But where are you in your state of your soul? You see, that's a very vital question. And a lot of people get to the end of their life and they never even consider how valuable a question that is and to meditate and muse on it and actually try to answer that question. And Ezekiel quotes this, I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken and strengthen the weak. Ezekiel 34, 16. Friends, I'm gonna tell you, this has always been God's mission. If you don't have that understood by now in your life, you're missing a huge point of the whole Bible and the Gospels. God is a seeker of those who are lost because they're in grave danger. This is a foundational understanding of the Bible and of our Lord God because he is a seeker of the lost. Now, people can tie you up in tongue-tied kind of questions and philosophical arguments, philosophy and everything, but the main thing should remain the main thing that Jesus is a seeker of those who are lost. In our fallenness, we're lost. In our blindness, we're lost. In our distance from God, we are lost. But as we learned from the prodigal son, who's waiting for the prodigal son as he comes home? It's the, it's the father. I'm gonna tell you right now, if you're in the far country and you're lost, I'm gonna tell you the great news here today is that you can be found. Just get up, just get up and come back to the Father. That's how simple it is. Jesus longs to seek those who are lost. And that's a very compassionate thing that Jesus has as a heartbeat for us. This wealthy city was very wealthy. People streamed into Jericho from foreign nations and everything bringing trade and goods, but they were being taxed to death because Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector and he was definitely on the top of his pyramid in the scheme to, to take taxes and also take a little skimming off the top from those that work with him. He was hated, he was ostracized, and he was not welcome in a lot of the social groups of his day. And we can learn that from Alfred Eidersheim in his book on the, uh, the life and times of Jesus the Messiah. It's a very amazing book. Well, his life turns upside down when he meets Jesus. And that's the key part of this whole story. In a land that was filled with Jesus' miracles, Zacchaeus must have heard about this teacher. This this person, this rabbi, who did some amazing stuff, like raising Jairus' daughter, or maybe it was the fact that he fed 5,000, or the 4,000, how could he do that? Maybe these, these rumors, you know, these, these wonderful comments about Jesus who would spread and flow throughout the land of Israel, I'm sure it caught his ears knowing that, that he was now about to uh, hear that Jesus was coming through Jericho. And so he runs to this sycamore tree and this low-lying tree and he gets up in the branches so he can see Jesus. Friends, how, how desperate are you to see Jesus? How desperate are you? Would you, uh, you know, forget the crowd? Would you uh, put off 
all those rules and regulations concerning what the crowd's supposed to do and climb up in a tree, even uh, being uh, shamed by the people that you're working around, maybe being laughed at by going to such lengths and, and uh, desperation to see Jesus. But I'm going to tell you, it's worth it. It's worth it. Let me tell you of a man who is a notorious criminal in Canada. His life starts at age eight in horrible crime. He's on the top list for the RCMP in Canada many, many years ago, Serge Leclerc. He is just a racketeer. He's involved with mafia families. He's, he's running a drug empire of $40 million. And he's doing these vicious things. I mean, there is more stuff about Serge I could tell you, but it would have to be edited. He ends up in jail, some of the severest penitentiaries in Canada and in a state of hopelessness and despair. The, guess what happens? This is amazing. A Bible finds its way into his cell and he starts to reading it out of curiosity because he's got, another, he's got lost all this time. Well, this Bible that he gets starts to work in his soul and he starts to feel the surge and, and, the, and, the, and the curiosity grow and he reads this Bible and he gives his life to Christ in, in solitary confinement and all these places that he's in. His story does not end at the penitentiary. He ends up actually gets out, gets pardoned, and as, as a new Christian now, he ends up in politics and becomes an amazing person in Canada that engages with change and transformation and working with people across Canada, especially in the province of Alberta. If you've never read the book, Untwisted, you should get it. It's an amazing story of our Savior's grace in this man's life and how it changed him upside down, turned him inside out, and he became a force in Canada for good change and for the Spirit of God. What, that, what the Spirit of God did in his life was absolutely miraculous. It turned him inside out. That's what happened to Zacchaeus. He encounters the Savior on this very sunny day and his life was never the same. Never the same. He, you could say, was untwisted too because all of a sudden, all these chains that came off him and he gives back fourfold to those that he defrauds. And he stands knowing now from Jesus' own lips that he's a son of Abraham because he's a son in the faith. What, what a glorious picture of redemption, transformation, and, and God's amazing grace in this man's life. Well, our Savior knew all about that, and he's still working on that. Serge Leclerc found it out. There's many others, many others who in history encountered God's grace and changed and were untwisted. They became vessels of God's amazing grace. One such person is John Newton. I don't know if you've ever heard of his story. He writes Amazing Grace, and it's amazing because God is amazing. He was a slave trader, and it says in history that when his boat came into the port, it had such a stench, it would make people sick on the shore. There's so many people died on his boat. And he was just horrible. He was a vicious man. But God changes him one night in a vicious storm out in the sea. And he huddles in the corner of a boat, knowing that it's going to be broken in half. And he'll be losing his life. He gave his life to Christ. On that boat. In that middle of the storm. And I can tell you that from that moment on, his life never, never, what was changed forever. John Newton comes back and he comes, becomes a pastor. He becomes a theologian. He writes Amazing Grace. And if you've ever been at a funeral lately, you will probably hear that song still sung. It's amazing testimony to God's grace. Friends, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? We have a seeking savior who's on an endless mission of mercy because he loves you so much. Do you love him? Do you know him? You know, he's, he's an amazing prophet, priest, and king. He holds all three offices, not just one. He's an amazing savior of love and grace. It says in, in the beginning of John's gospel that he came here with grace and truth. Isn't that amazing? He came here with grace and truth, loving us and helping us and showing us the way 
that we can move forward. His message was a merciful one. His life was a merciful one. His mission was merciful. His attitude was merciful. His heartbeat was an unending, relentless joy. And even looking unto the cross, it says in Hebrews, he endured the cross with the joy set before him. Could you say that about your death penalty? Could you say that about your death penalty? I meet so many people that are so unhappy today. They have no, no joy about anything, but Jesus was full of joy. My friends, he found Saul of Tarsus. He found Zacchaeus in a tree. He found the woman at the well. He found Philip. Yes, he did. He found Matthew. And you know what I'm going to tell you today? I'm going to be honest about it. He can find you because he knows where you are. He knows where you are right now. All you need to do is get off that couch or off that chair, bend the knee to Jesus and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I. I give you my life. Here am I. Change me. Use me. Forgive me of my sin. And use me in a way that I can't imagine because I'm yours now. I'm not the world's anymore. I'm yours. In conclusion, Billy Graham once said, some of the most miserable people, he said, I have ever known were highly successful in the eyes of the world, but down inside they were less restless and spiritually empty. Friends, are you spiritually empty today? You don't have to be. You don't have to be. You can be spiritually full by making that prayer your prayer today. Oh, my friends, he comes to those that are adrift spiritually, mentally, and emotionally, and he can lead you in the way of everlasting. Friends, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, if you know Jesus, as a born-again believer in Jesus, Keep going for Christ. Seek those that are in your life too with prayer and also with an obligation that's in your heart to love them, love them relentlessly, and love them unconditionally. Friends, and your hate will be removed and your love be replaced and the emptiness in your heart will be truly filled. You know why? Because he's always a seeking savior and he knows where you are. Isn't that a good truth to know today? He knows all about you. He knows your name and that's an amazing thing. If you don't know Jesus, here at Citadel Church, we love him. I love him, and it would be my greatest joy that if you were in this week coming into this church to look into this matter more, I'd be happy to do that for you because I want you to know that you are loved, not just because of the church, but because of Jesus. He loves you. Give your life to him and see the change that will happen like Serge Leclerc and John Newton. They were testimonies to God's amazing grace, shall we pray. Father, thank you for this day, and we just give you this message today, Lord, from our hearts that you would just use it, Lord. Bring those that you need to come and bring those to the well of salvation that they might be free, that their despair would be turned around and, and they would have the joy of salvation brimming in their heart. What a day it is. We're on pills and all this therapy and all these things, but we don't have the right thing so often. We need you, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Maranatha. Amen. God bless you. And next week, I look forward to being with you again with another sermon to stir your soul. Amen. God bless you.